I'm going to pray first. Father, forgive. Forgive me for not applying all your word. For knowing, for knowing it, but at times forgetting to act on it. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you come along and give that tap on the back of the head to say, what are you doing? And I thank you, Lord, that we can come to you and seek forgiveness and also come to you and ask that you help us understand and help us to take what you say and allow it to shape our lives. So we're your people. Do with us as you will. I ask that in your precious name. Amen. So I presume I've got volume and everything. So that's good. Ah. Guess what this is? Back back. Well, actually, it's not quite a backpack. It's one of these fancy things that has... It's uh, a little bit of a fancy camera bag, actually. Uh, we have a couple of YouTubers we follow. Uh, they're English, and uh, they do photography, and fascinating, and love the photo photos they, they take. And I, I guess that's one of the reasons why I like you know, pictures like this. You know. um, yeah, I'd be love to be able to take that. So I actually got myself a camera. I have myself a camera, and, I, and in my bag I have the, the battery charger for it, and. Uh, and um, I'll put that over there. And, you know, and I've got a, the, the little stand that, you know, that can be made to go all sorts of, you know, and get it in that awkward right position. So I've got one of, one of those. Whoops. Though it's fallen apart. Um, what else? Um, oh, I've got lens covers of different sorts here. Uh, you know, like these to shade the lenses. Uh, oh, power cables, they're important. Um, what, uh, oh, that's a remote control for the camera, you know, and uh, and I've got these things. These are these are lenses, you know that, and I have no idea what the mother, most of them do. They're still in their plastic, you know, and they, you know, they're supposed to filters, filters. That's what they they're, they're filters there, and um, what else have I got? Uh, oh. Oh yeah, more battery gear, of course. And I've got that battery gear, and at the top, I've got another camera bag. It's a small one, so if you want to just carry it, it's there. And and finally, is that it? Is that everything? Yeah, I have a camera. Yes, I do have a camera in my camera bag. Uh, this one is a Canon Parashot SX70 HS. There you go. Sounds very fancy. Um, do I know how to use this? Not really. Um, I can put it on auto and take photos. Uh, I have fiddled occasionally with it. But I'm probably more apt at taking a photo on this thing <laughs> than I'm on this thing. Well, that, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's true. These are, these are definitely better. Uh, these are competing nowadays. But, yeah, I've, I've still got a long way to go to learn on this. But I have it. I have it. But there's a big difference between having it and using it and knowing about it. I hope to move from having to using and knowing uh, on, th on this trip, it's one of my one of my goals, and also to figure out why I got so much stuff. Um, I'm not going to put that down there. I'll put that down there. <laughs> you can spot the photographers in the room. They're going, "Yeah, you'll enjoy." <laughs> but that important question of you might have something, but are you using it? You know, do you know how to use it properly? I mean, I'm sure all of us have got in our house, probably in the back of a cupboard somewhere, something that we got that we're going to use and do this and that, and we never have. But we've got it. It'll come in handy one day. I'll get around to it. Yeah, I'll get around to it. Oh, I'm gonna. 
I'm going to, I'm going to do that one day. Yeah, I'm going to learn how to do that. I'm going to. I'm sure we've all got similar things. The danger is when we apply that approach to God and his word. I'm going to read you know, the Bible. You know, I, I'm, I've got a Bible and I'm going to read it. You know, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to pray more because I, I, I know prayer is important. Uh, and I know how to pray. I'm just not, haven't got the time right now. It is really having something and actually using it are two very different things. And the, today's message is really just follow him. Uh, it's about following him and knowing who he is and, and actually what it means to follow him. And that was the passages of of today. Uh, Luke records in his gospel account just before the passage that Bill read out for us that one day Jesus was alone praying, probably a bit of a hint there, you know, what might be a good model of uh, lifestyle, but he was alone praying. He got away from the crowds, he got away from the noise, he got away from distractions. He was praying and, uh, and <laughs> only his disciples were with him at the time. And it says that he, he came up to his disciples and he asked this question of them, who do people say I am? You know, and that's the question that's still asked today, that we should be asking, well, who do people say Jesus is? We've just had Easter. You know, what are people saying about Jesus? You know, irrelevant, a myth, oh, a good teacher, thankful we got a holiday out because of him who do people say i am and this is jesus's question to the people because he's been doing some of these miracles and stuff and his disciples they replied with some very popular um you know identifications that they're obviously going around at the time uh one of course was john the baptist you know you, you will know that john uh, the baptist led this sort of national back to god movement uh, that you know, sort of was heralding the way for Jesus' coming. Uh, and he upset King Herod by saying, eh, your marriage is uh, not with, in line with God's the teaching. And consequently, King Herod uh, beheaded him. Uh, sometimes it's costly speaking up for the truth. Um, so he thought that, may, you know, so the thought was that maybe Jesus is John the Baptist come back to life to hassle King Herod a bit more. Others said Elijah because the people were expecting Elijah to turn up. Uh, you know, all one of the, you know, you got there. Elijah was uh, had spoken boldly for God, challenging the prophets of Baal uh, in this really dramatic contest. Of course, and you can read about that in One Kings eighteen. Uh, and later, his ministry was sort of associated with the last days. Uh, and Malachi four, five, and six says, "Look, I am sending you the prophet Elijah." before the great and dreadful day of the Lord arrives. His preaching will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. Otherwise, I will come and strike the land with a curse. So, you know, they were kind of hoping Elijah will turn up, you know, because uh, that would be sort of indication that God's stepping in. Yeah! And of course, God's for us, not for them. So that's, you know, it's a good thing. Or one of the other prophets, because... You know, in like the prophets, because Jesus was being quite prophetic in nature and of his ministry. So there were common expectations about looking at who Jesus was. And, and the, the guys there, the disciples there, got up there and said, well, this, this is who the people say. And of course, then this comes this really uh, important question, a personal question, uh, that really every follower of Jesus has got to answer. Who do you say I am? Yeah. Who do we say Jesus is? You know, how do we answer that? And, and we can give a Sunday school answer. I mean, I, back to this camera, I can tell you bits and pieces about this camera. There's the power button. 
Yeah, I, I can tell you that. That's got a lens cap on it. I can tell you bits of things. This is a camera, you know, it takes photos. Yeah, but so does every other camera. What's unique about this sort of camera? Um, who do you say I am? This is a question we have to answer when it comes to Jesus. Now, Peter gave that sort of uh, rather, you know, <laughs> inspirational answer. Uh, for he, you know, he plainly stated with this conviction that Jesus was the long-expected Messiah. Uh, it, it was clear that, uh, that Jesus w has a unique place in, in God's plan and in fact that you know, he was the divinely promised deliverer who'd come to set people free and establish the kingdom of God in righteousness and peace. You know, that's who you are, Jesus. You know, who do people say, I, who do you say I am? You are the Messiah. Sent from God. Peter recognised it. Amazingly, he recognised it. Still didn't go, I don't think, got it, get it. You know, the Messiah had to come indeed and the anointed one would reign over the people, uh, over his people, as the angel told Mary earlier. But the nature of his rule was to actually be a very different path to what people would have expected. You know? <laughs> in some ways, we still do it today. We say, God, why don't you get in there and do something about this situation? You know? We, we almost want the lightning from heaven, you know, striking this, you know, you know, just, it's <laughs> they were expecting that. They were expecting a Messiah to come along who was just going to sweep away their enemies. But no, the, the Messiah was coming, was going to come and follow the way of suffering and death and rejection, uh, a point that would be made clear in response to Peter's amazing statement, you are the Messiah. always fascinated me that Peter has said that statement, you are the Messiah uh, uh, sent by God, sent of God, I should say. Uh, so, uh, and then Jesus says, don't tell anyone. Uh, you know, when someone comes to Christ, what do I want to do? I don't want to tell everybody. They want to, just want to go around, you know, they just want to run around and say, oh, I've discovered Jesus. And, you know, and, for, and it's beautiful and it's wonderful and it's challenging and sometimes it's really awkward. But it's, it's the response. So imagine how these guys, you know, felt, you know, who do you say I am? Peter says, you're the Messiah. And they go, oh, yeah. And then Jesus says, uh-uh, lips sealed. This is, <laughs> you're not to tell anyone who I am. And part of that was probably because, as often happened when Jesus, through Jesus' ministry, uh, people would misunderstand. Like I said, they were expecting a conquering hero, sort of, uh, uh, you know, descendant of David who would come and... Uh, clear out the unrighteous rulers and especially in this case wipe out the Romans uh, you know, and, and Israel would be restored to the time of David and Solomon and in all its glory um, but that's not the case Jesus then lays on to them what's going to happen and you've got to remember this is the first time they hear this and he, and he said, no, no the, the Son of Man must suffer many terrible things. You know, he's going to be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the, the religious leaders. He, he's going to die. He's going to be killed. However, that's not the end of the story. On the third day, he will rise again. And we've just celebrated that truth last week but this is the first time they're hearing it this is the first time they're going to hear 
that the one they're following, one who's been identified as the one sent by God, is actually going to go down this path of suffering and, and, and be killed. You know, they were expecting the, the victor path. Now in Luke 22, 9.22, Jesus has just said it for the very first time, but he will say it several times. He will again refer to it later in this chapter in verse 44. He'll mention it in chapter 12. He'll mention it in chapter 17. He'll go into it again in chapter 18. Um, and the reason why? They don't get it. They don't get it. Remember in the garden? We've got some swords, we'll go fight. Yeah. You don't get it, guys. I've come to actually suffer and die for the sins of the world. That's why I'm here. That's the person you're following. Not the person who's going to have military victories over the Romans. Not the person who's going to go and create this vast empire like the Romans. All the Greeks, all the Brits, all the French. He says, no, no, I'm not doing that. That's not the path I'm going on. The one you're following is willing to die for you. And then he says, he says that, so he's asked this of his disciples you know, that's close to him. And then he addresses the crowd. <laughs> he says, if any, if any of you, if any of you wants to be my follower, this is what you've got to do. You must give up your own way. What? Yeah, you've got to give up your own way of doing things. You've, you've got to give up insisting that you have your way in things. You must take up your cross. And Luke is the only one who says daily. But take it up each and every day. You know, I've, I've heard people say, oh no, I, you know, I became, I was baptised as an infant or you know, oh, I gave my life to Christ when I was 16. You know, and they're in their 50s and you go, so um, where do you go to church? I don't. Uh, you know. uh, so do you, are you part of a Christian group? No. Nah. When was the last time you went to church? Oh, that would have been Uncle Fred's funeral back in. Now, you, you've got to give up your own way, he says. If anyone wants to be my follower, they must turn from their selfish ways, take up their cross daily and follow me. And all who want to follow him have to take up that every single day. We need to remember that the disciples had never heard this before, by the way, because they, you know, a cross to them, the, in the reference to what Jesus was saying, is the thing the Romans used to kill people. So what Jesus is basically saying to them, it'd be like, okay, take your noose, your rope, ready to hang yourself every day and, and take it with you. I can imagine the crowd going, what? This is so confusing. And the language that he says this, by the way, is that you're not to just listen to this, but you're, you actually have to obey it. You know, that's why you know, Luke puts in there, every day, do this. The disciples must follow the master every day, every moment of life. Uh, Self-interest must not dominate the lives of the believers and followers. It doesn't mean we don't have self-interest. Instead, as God's people, we're willing to suffer and deny ourselves each day, just like our Lord, rather than focus on our own self-interest. And each day will bring us our own share of burdens and opportunities to put this into practice. You know, where we will uh, 
suffer. We will struggle with things. But Jesus says, give up doing it your way. Take up your cross. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be costly and follow me. So I want to ask, how are you going in following our Lord Jesus this way? If we're honest, I think most of us will probably go, this is tough. This is tough. To follow Jesus this way. I can do my Bible reading. I can pick up my camera. I can fiddle with it. And so I've played with my camera. I can do my Bible reading. Yep, I've done my 10 minutes of Bible reading. I've said my two minutes prayer. Right, I'm off into the rest of the day. Some of the stats for reading your Bible for yourself and for praying amongst ministers of religion are quite scary. On average, you know. You get those who, uh, who pray three or four hours a day, you know, and that's before they start their day, and I'm in awe of those guys. You know, I, I, I must admit I tend to need this before I start the day. And I tend to pray throughout the day. There are people who just read God's word uh, and then allow it to shape them and do amazing things with it. But on average, it's, you know, the average minister, short prayer time, short Bible reading time, and in congregations it tends to be worse. And that's not taking up our cross daily and following him. having stated what it means to follow him, you know, some do question, is it worth it? Is it worth giving control of my life, the dreams I have, the things I want, and the things I would like to do, you know, is it worth giving those up when it'd be so much easier not trying to live up to someone else's standard, in this case God's standard, um, and only live up to my own? And you know what the beauty about having your own standard is? Oh, that's too hard. Yep, that's, that's comfortable. I can change my own standard to suit me. Whereas God's standard just remains there, which is a real nuisance at times. And then Jesus says, what, I'm expected to suffer? I want good times. You know, I want the easy path, the minimum inconvenience, the no ripples in my life, that smooth, painless sailing along through life. And to do this, or just to follow Jesus, true, he is God, true, he, you know, he did die for the sins of the world, including mine, true, he does offer hope, you know, a hope-filled future, but it's hard being a follower. And the Lord sort of addresses this sort of thinking. He says, thinking, by the way, I would say that sort of thinking is too common in our churches. He makes the statement, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. Those who want to hang on to their life will work to get the best for themselves. Such people will try to hold on to earthly rewards and create a security on earth that in the end, they won't be able to keep. You know, <laughs> the richest person in the world, what's he going to take with him when he leaves or she leaves? Uh, the person who's, you know, built up this huge company empire. What do they get when, at the end? Yeah. Possibly the praise of men, yep. Uh, probably a big thank you from those who will inherit what they, yeah. Yes, possibly. You know, 
It's, yeah, that's, and then this is one of the amazing things that you build up this great you know, empire and resources and everything and then you've actually got to end on to someone else who may not be as passionate, caring, engaged as you are and just squambles it away. I am not going to be asked about my BMW F800 GS <laughs> and the amazing trips I did on it when I stand before the Lord. I'm not going to be asked about how cleverly I used my money to build a very comfortable, comfortable retirement package for myself. My house, my car, my camera, my lifestyle, none of that will be matter and it will be gone when I die. Yeah. I am not going to be going into heaven and going, oh, look at that, click. Oh, look at that, click. click. It's gone. By contrast, those who generously give up their lives, willing to lose them, if necessary, for the sake of Jesus and the kingdom, they find true life. Uh, that person will give up in order to gain and what they gain is of greater value because it has this eternal component to it. You know, those who invest their life in Christ and his kingdom, you know, they receive eternal life. And, and as well, right now, the satisfaction of knowing you're doing what God wants. It, you know, when you do something that God wants, yeah, it feels good. When you're not doing something that God, you know God wants, you feel rotten. You're going, oh, I should be doing this. I should be... Mm -mm. Those who give themselves up for Christ actually find their lives filled. And by the way, the stories here of doing that is one of the blessings of being here. And that's the paradox of discipleship, isn't it? That um, in order to live, we need to stop living our way, but living his way. And that's why Paul could say, yes, everything is w worthless when compared to the infinite value of knowing Christ my Lord. And having made that statement, by the way, if you think it is not, it's a struggle and it's, you know, oh, is it worth it? And I think we all go through moments like that, that you know, times when we question which i think is actually healthy that we should question um it, it's not healthy just to ask the question and not try to answer it jesus makes this statement to the, to following him what what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but have lost you are lost or destroyed in other words you lose your soul you lose your eternal hope you lose you know, that relationship with Jesus. Sadly, too many people have been willing to turn away from following Jesus in order to stay in a relationship or hold on to a sin or stay in the career. You know, and Jesus says, what does that gain you? You, know, you lose when you do that. You can gain the whole world, but you will still lose there's nothing as valuable as one's relationship with Jesus. He goes on to say, if you're actually ashamed of me, if you're ashamed of me, which means you're pursuing what the world wants, if you're ashamed of me, then when I return, which he will do, I'll be ashamed of you. And you'll miss out. That's the warning that Jesus has just given this crowd. The cost of following him, it's costly. Please don't, when you're talking to someone about coming to Christ, say, oh, when you come to Christ, life will be so much better. Because often that means for the person, oh, all my problems will disappear. It's true, life will be better. But <laughs> put it in the right context, please, and say, you have someone who is with you in those situations and gives you hope to the future. 
part of this giving up my life to follow Jesus is I'm not going to be ashamed of him. I'm not going to be ashamed of talking about his message. Uh, and, and I will happily talk about his message in a gracious, caring, loving, Christ-like way. Yeah, we've just had Easter. Yeah. We've had the great opportunities to talk about what Easter was like. Yeah. How was your Easter? It was great. Celebrated at church. It was nice to see the church full. You know, I think everyone's sort of like, well, we did two last week. Maybe I can skip this week. I don't know. Anyway. Um, shh, naughty. Naughty. Sorry about that. Life happens. But we're not ashamed of who Jesus is. Our culture will want us to be ashamed. Uh, what someone told me that on Q&A, someone asked the question, what has Christianity ever done for us? I burst out laughing. I thought that is such a naive, ignorant question to ask. But I wonder if there was any Christians in the audience who sp spoke up. Our world will try to tell us to be quiet. Let's not be quiet, but let's be gracious in how we speak out. Taking on this commitment to Jesus includes you know, dealing with a hostile world. Look, it was hostile for him. All through history, it's been hostile. You know, it's, it's not new what we face. But we need to make sure we actually do follow him, that each day... We are doing it and doing it his way. You know, I like how you said, Carol, it's hard. And it is hard. That's why we need each other. But we need to make a choice. We have it. Are we going to use it? We have it, are we going to use it? If I don't use that, it just takes up cupboard space. If I don't use this, I'm putting my eternal future at risk. Each day, following him, his way. Jesus finishes his conversation. He says, I tell you the truth, some standing here right now will not die before they seek the kingdom of God. Uh, I'm not going to... I go, yeah, what does that really mean? And I'm glad the commentaries go, well, we're not really sure. It could be the transfiguration that's going to happen shortly. It could be you know, after the resurrection because you know, his disciples saw it and plenty of people in the crowd would have seen that. Judas didn't, interestingly enough. Or it could have been Pentecost, who knows? We just know that, yeah, some people are going to see God's kingdom at work. But for you and me, here today, who is Jesus? Who do you say Jesus is? Is he the one that you are committed to each and every day of allowing to have control over who I am who I'm willing to step up and knowing that that can be costly at times, but I want to follow him. Not me, not them, him. Is the answer that they maybe should have give, gave Jesus instead of saying the Messiah, you're the one who I'm going to follow. I don't know. Who are you going to say? Let's pray. Lord, for the first disciples there, you know, in the crowd, and who heard that for the very first time, I could imagine the car park conversations of trying to figure out what, what you meant and, and starting to ask the cost of, you know, is, is, you know, wow, is this what it's going to cost? 
I mean, Lord, I'm sure many of us are here have read this passage, have heard this passage so many times. But the question that you asked, who are you, is so, so relevant today. In your statement about not following you and what do you gain from that and what it means to follow you is so, so relevant today. For the person here who is struggling to follow, that the idea of each day taking up a willingness to follow you, to take on the role of servant, to take on the role of willing to suffer, the role of willing to give up own self-interest for others and follow you, that that is such a struggle. Holy Spirit, step in and lift and remind, remind them, remind us actually all, of the hope we have in you, the future the, 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 that we have in you and the goal of actually <laughs> spending eternity with you. For the person here today who go, is just in their head going, yes, Lord, it's about following you each day. Help them to be an encouragement and example to those around them. Thank you for their servant nature. Thank you for their willingness to each day put self after you that they want you, they're allowing you to control their life. And they are following you. We praise you for them. And thank you for the encouragement and the encouraging people they are. But for all of us, Lord, help us to follow you every day doing it your way. I say in your precious name, Amen.